This is poet and novelist Mackenzie Bodkin, author of The Water Mage's Daughter. In hopes that you'll find a way in your own voice to read my adventurous love story to friends or someone you love, I'll start out by reading Canto One myself, the beginning of the story, so that you can hear it and read along with me if you feel like it. This should give you a good idea of at least one way to experience this high fantasy novel written in verse. Canto One is about a young man who makes a terrible mistake. It's entitled Cursed. I've put some music under the reed for you to enjoy as you listen to the tale. Thanks for watching. A thoughtless act can change the world. Its seed, by time's thick mists and swirled, will slowly grow beyond mind's reach to gather weight and girth as each ensuing day compounds the woe it spawned until life's quid pro quo comes due. Just so, one fateful morn, when Devlin, he to kingship born, the high prince of the Rowan Hills, boot splashed his way through sparkling rills and drew his blade. I dare you, laughed Calman of Clue, mead sotted daft and wild-eyed too. Before them stood a rowan tree, its gracile wood and arc of limbs alone within a ring of trees. Oh dear, a sin, Devlin's drinking companion grinned. What look, the braggart look chagrined and chastened. Lost your nerve then, eh? I should have known you'd cast away your only chance to break a rule in your whole life. Be silent, fool, growled a Devlin. I, I'll do it, watch. He flipped away the sweat-stained swatch of long dark hair hung down his cheek and felled the little tree. A smeek of sizzling sap burned in his nose as Devlin danced back on his toes. Then he and Kalman, slapping backs, rode off along the well-worn track that wound down from the sacred copse of Hilltop Rowans. Both made stops to empty bladders in the brush, then elbowed through the mead house crush up to the bar to drink yet more and chuckle at their land's quaint lore. Thou shalt not harm a Rowan tree. Aye, perhaps for them, not you and me, though, Devlin quipped and quaffed his mead. But then the Rowan's vengeful reed began. The old dead wood shot sprigs, quick serpent's tongues of twisting twigs from out the brim of Calman's bowl and gripped his head. The Rowan's soul within the ancient bowl yawned wide, then bit his face to seal inside his nose and mouth. He reared and fell struggling to foist the choking swell of pintish waves at his breath's shore. And though he flailed and kicked, three more tough leaf blade withies strapped his head, then bore into it. Shot with dread, Devlin leapt down and tried to tear the horrid things from Kalman's hair. Instead those leaves like razors fell upon his frantic hands pell-mell. He kicked away in magic dread, afraid to help. Kalman lay dead, a bloody shrub grown on his head, his face dark wood. And there in red and smoking script across the bowl, Devlin spied words as on a scroll. But your blood, hewer of my wood, my wind-tossed flesh by seasons ringed, will gush when life does sweetest thrive like flowers, berries, soon to be. Then will the lifeblood in your veins flood my old roots and nourish me. To Devlin's knowledge, Rowan's rose to make crops grow. Now terror froze him in his place, the guilty kind, for now he'd learned the truth behind his people's ancient homily. Thou shalt not harm a Rowan tree. 
his young life, he'd never thought to probe the adage much. Now caught in his own folly, Devlin stared at what he'd wrought, at what he'd dared to do. The young prince rose and fled, to ride on home, his best friend dead. A sacred grove tree felled as well was more than he could face. To dwell near Owens now that he'd been cursed by one seemed madness. Weird coerced, death panicked, fearing every tree he saw, he galloped guiltily for his land's borders, past the arch he'd always loved, and past the march between his uncle's Rowanwolds and forests dotted with freeholds, where Rowans did not choke the slopes along the road, and he had hopes of maybe gaining some plateau where Rowan magic could not go. Past farms he rode, their streams ablaze in sunlight, through the smoky haze of villages he had never seen, past goat-strewn hills where tree stumps green with withies sucked the elder light from Earth's dark realms. In mindless flight, on through the night beneath the moon he galloped, a dark chaperone whom no one knew, and on till dawn, until Exhausted and withdrawn, he slept against his horse's back, next to the narrow, lonely track he'd followed last. It passed through fields, well clear of any Rowan wields. By noontime, Sun red-lit his lids and wakened him. Two katydids were mating on a nodding stem above his face. But disturbing them seemed not the thing to do just then, so he lay still and thought again of what he'd done. God's bones, I'm dead, he sighed aloud, shaking his head. Will Uncle Bruss forgive me this? I don't see how. No cowardice had Devlin ever shown, with men at least. But this tree specimen used magic for its weaponry, not swords or pikes. It's time to flee a little further then, I guess. He moaned and gently pulled a tress of grass to one side. Clinging tight, the bugs seemed bent on their delight as he stepped lightly by. The road led onward till the distance showed a wide lake burning in the sun with coruscations. Five days' run brought him to hills splashed pink and blue by springtime's recent rendezvous with autumn's seeds. Far off, a town, its upper outskirts dripping down the hillsides, puddled at the lake's northwestern shore. Passing some breaks and wildflowers, Devlin approached the cattle fence whose rails encroached on meadows at the town's preludes. Knee-deep in blooms, she bent to choose her flowers there, a maiden did. Braids roped her chestnut hair amid bright ribbons wound in here and there. If she saw him, she didn't care to show it, as he slowed to stare at her intriguing derriere. 